Hello, everyone. We're back live with uh, the WordPress and artificial intelligence event uh, we're having today, the next chapter of WordPress and AI. We're here with uh, Marianne Curio from uh, the Canadian VC company Georgian. And uh, the title of your session is so exciting to me, The Future of AI is Open Source. We heard uh, a couple of references already to kind of uh, um, open source being in the core of future AI development. Uh, John uh, said in his session uh, how companies are discussing right now, especially in the VC space, how open source is actually the real threat, like there is no competition to that. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share. Um, take it away. Ooh, thank you so much. Thank you for a warm, uh, warm intro. Uh, yeah, and uh, thank you so much for attending our talks. My name is uh, Kirill and I'm here with uh, Maria. We both work at uh, Georgian and today we're going to chat about our work in AI and open source. So a couple of, couple of words about Georgian, what a Georgian is. So we are Canadian VC firm. So our main business, we invest in a companies from B to C stage, but uh, while we are talking today about AI and open source, and uh, you will see that the talk would be quite technical at some moment, uh, because one of the main differentiator of uh, of a Georgian is that we have our own R and D team, which is right now around like forty uh, engineer and scientist, and the reason why we have it because we work with our company in a post-investment stage by helping them with machine learning, engineering, and uh, and in general, like AI strategy inside of, of their company. We don't build our companies for this. It's a pure value add. It's basically our way of de-risking our investment with leveraging our own internal expertise uh, in, in AI. Uh, Small disclaimer, nothing we're going to talk about, talking today, not an investment advice, we're not going to share about Georgian a lot about like a performance. It's uh, our work in open source, which we will leverage a lot. But everything what we describe today is done in the public data sets with uh, with the public uh, models. A small trailer before we go into the talk itself. That uh, if if this would resonate with you and you would like to go deeper, or maybe there's something we would not be able to cover in some details or uh, some additional or you have some additional question uh today's talk based on a series of blog posts we publish it in medium in our in our georgian um, blog uh where basically cover all this like in a very detailed view with all numbers with all codes so uh, this talk is basically short summary and overview of our series of blog posts which we still publishing right now and the new one would be would be quiet soon. So yeah, uh, feel free to check it out. And this is like a small small trailer. So on this, I would like to pass it to my to my colleague uh, Maria. Maria, please uh, go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. So as it was said, uh, today's talk will be closely connected with the series of blog posts uh, we have been working on about fine tuning open source LLMs, about deploying them on different platforms and also about benchmarking the inference. Uh, so first, what I would like to talk about is about, in general, about LLMs and what opportunities uh, they give us, uh, what, opportunities, what opportunities can we get with this very fast developing uh, open source uh, community. Uh, then I will talk about uh, LLMs training and I will explain how it can be done uh, fast and uh, at a low cost. Uh, which makes uh, creation of custom LLMs uh, very possible now. Uh, also, I will talk about the LoRa method, which we used for LLM training and uh, which actually made this training fast and uh, cost effective. And we will end the talk with the deployment, uh, which is basically the essential part of putting your LLM into production, making, making it uh, available to the public. Uh, so let's move to the first uh, point in our agenda is LLMs and uh, with the emergence of ChatGPT, a lot of companies uh, decided to, to integrate large language models into their operations 
And uh, as OpenAI ChatGPT4 uh, aims to be the top choice uh, for this task, and with the API, which seems like an easy solution, uh, we will demonstrate that this is not always the case, and that uh, it is also uh, better to do sometimes with open source models, uh, which will come into much less cost. Uh, it, it is also easy and uh, uh, you don't lose in effectiveness and accuracy. So uh, before moving straight to the LLMs training, I would like to talk about some of the LLMs which you should to keep an eye on. And there are two groups, groups which are closed source and open source LLMs. Uh, in our uh, blog post, we majorly work with open source and I will explain why we picked this one. So for the plan T5, uh, it was designed to do specific tasks like summarization, classification. So basically, when you ask plan to summarize a text, it does know what to do, that it should really summarize. Uh, talking about Falcon, uh, it is a very popular model, which was trained on a very high quality data set, uh, which made it uh, quite popular in the community and it is loved by researchers. Uh, then there is a red pajama, which showed good performance on many different devices. And red pajama 3B is one of the strongest in this group of LLMs. And uh, also Lemma 2, which was trained in, on much more data than Lemma 1. And also they integrated the user feedback into the, uh, into the new model. Uh, so this is basically, you can read more about each of our experiments for each of the models in the uh, respective uh, blog posts uh, and find out more about, about the models itself. So moving to uh, LM training, I would like to talk first about the motivation. So why you should ever consider training your custom LLM. And uh, as I said before, uh, JGPT and their API might seem as a very easy solution. You get the good accuracy and it's like easy to use, but this uh, working with closed source LLMs, uh, you might you face certain limitations. First of all, this is compliance challenges. As you might know, using third-party APIs uh, is bad for personal data because it might be exposed, and uh, you probably wouldn't want that to happen. Uh, so with open source LLMs, you control all the process where your data goes and so on, and uh, this is better for your product. Uh, you have much more protection of your data. Uh, then there is overlines factor, which means that uh, you are basically dependent on the, the third party providers. So if they experience some downtimes uh, in their work, uh, you also it also directly affects your product. And you can't control the quality, you can't uh, do some uh, uh, additional stuff with your models, and it basically you have no control in short. Uh, over this uh, when using closed source uh, LLMs. And the last but not least is differentiation challenges. Uh, so when you use uh, open source LLMs, you first can incorporate your user's feedback uh, into the product, which uh, logically makes it much better. Also, you can make it really your LLM, so you can make it unique and it will uh, improve the overall quality and uh, will help you win over your competitors. Uh, in the field. So uh, how to actually make LLM your LLM? There are basically two options, which are fine tuning and drag, which is retrieval augmented generation. And you can use two, two of them, both of them at the same time actually, but uh, in our blog posts, we concentrated on fine tuning. LLMs have been trained on a very large corpus of data. And now these models with these pre-trained weights are accessible to the public and developers can basically download them and then uh, use them for fine tuning to tailor these uh, large language models for their, down, uh, for their specific tasks. Uh, so how it works is that developers take some fine tuning data set, they uh, send an input to the model, uh, it generates some token, then it is compared to the ground truth and this way you update the weights. Uh, this is how regular fine tuning works, but I will add a small um, modification to this schema. As you can see in the picture, uh, we 
can, we can freeze the pre-trained weights and apply changes only to the some subset of weights, uh, which we then add to the pre-trained weights and get the fine-tuning uh, model. Uh, so this is the, a bit a gentle uh, introduction to the how LoRa works using this uh, modified schema. Uh, and how the regular fine tuning uh, costs actually it costs a lot because we can think about the parameters of the model as a very large matrices. And during the fine tuning, we do different operations with those matrices, which are computationally expensive. So uh, logically, it will take a lot of time to fine tune such uh, such a big uh, to train LLM, and it will just take a lot of time and. Uh, consequently, a big it will cost a lot. So this can be omitted with LoRa, uh, which uh, really reduces the cost for fine tuning the LLM. Uh, and how does it work? Is that uh, basically uh, LoRa introduces the matrix uh, uh, matrix split. Uh, so. Uh, the idea behind the lore is that we have the, our pre-trained weights which are freezed and we have a subset uh, of weights that we want to update and we uh, just introduce the low rank parameters and we split the matrix into the two parts. Uh, so this big, this big matrix of the weights which we want to update, we split them into two smaller matrices which takes much less time to update. And then we do the uh, the actual fine tuning, and then update the weights again. So this takes much less time uh, than the uh, regular fine tuning. Um, and actually, we uh, tested for the plan T five uh, here on the this table is took from our from our blog post. And here you can see the three columns, which are training samples, training time, and training cost. Uh, so for the training samples, uh, you can see that for 10,000 roughly uh, samples, it took only two hours to fine tune, and it costed costed a little bit more than two dollars, which is less than a cup of coffee, um, using uh, the Amazon compute. Um, so what about the performance? Is that in general we only lose like two percent from of accuracy for apart from full fine tuning? And uh, what what we gain is that with LoRa we are able to train uh, 30 billion models on just one single GPU. So the advantage is huge. Um, and now I want to move to the very important part. So when you fine tune your LLM, it is important to uh, make it accessible to the public. And uh, on this note, we I will talk about the deployment. So there are some things to consider, um, which the things you should worry about when you are deploying your LLM is the inference, co inference cost, latency, and RPC. So basically, inference cost is how much it costs to process, for example, 1,000 tokens. Uh, then it comes latency. So you want your server, uh, your product to work fast. And uh, this is um, how fast the users can basically uh, get the responses on their requests. And then comes RPC, which is basically how much load your uh, server can handle, how many re re requests per second it can process. And there are certain uh, stuff which, which influences these three things, which is the deployment platform, uh, basically where you deploy it, uh, whether this is a custom server or inference server, as we will look later. Uh, also, the instance type is uh, like machine on which you uh, host, the, uh, host the server. And uh, this is depends on what, how powerful are GPUs that you are using for each of them. Uh, and also the size of the model, but as we have seen, uh, according to our experiments, it doesn't influence uh, these things that much, but it's also important to think about uh, because even uh, all models can be trained mm -hmm. on different number of parameters and uh, some of them can be bigger than others. Uh, so talking about the deployment platform, uh, you have several options. First is the custom server and inference server. Custom server is, uh, is your, basically you write uh, the server yourself and you deploy the model there. 
and inference over uh, is a better because this is a already written uh, server with a lot of optimizations under the hood and you don't need a lot of knowledge to use it and to deploy your LLM there uh, and especially now with uh, how taking into account how the how fast the field of open source AI is developing there are a lot of instructions and details and tutorials how to use them so uh, it's basically much easier because if you will if you decide to write your custom server you, it will be much more time consuming and you might and you'll be challenging to uh, compete with the existing uh, alternatives so here uh, as we did in our experiments, we tried to deploy Red Pajama 7 billion uh, classification model, and we used Fast API, which is a, a web framework uh, for which is a web server used uh, with Python, um, and uh, also we used text generation inference, which is the inference server developed by Hugging Face. And you can see that the, and uh, what we did is we did load testing. So we were sending different number of records per second and uh, measuring the time, how much, how many seconds it takes to get responses on all of these records. So for fast API, you can see that the four seconds, uh, four records was the maximum number of records the server could handle. And it took more than 25 seconds to get the responses. And on the right side, you can see the text generation inference results. And it took, uh, we were able to process a little bit more than 120 records in under the four seconds, which is a huge uh, improvement comparing to Fast API. And all these numbers influence the cost per 1000 tokens. So you can see that this is also much cheaper. And uh, it took us some time to write the Fast API server actually. When with text generation inference, you just need to uh, run two commands, and this is it. So uh, moving forward, uh, there are different inference servers you should uh, you should keep an eye on. So first is the text generation inference by Hugging Face, which is very easy to use, which is also very fast. And then there is Ray uh, Triton, which can propose you such framework like Faster Transformer, which is also um, supports many architectures of LLMs and can make the inference uh, quite fast. And many others, uh, like every day, I think uh, some new appears on the, in the field. Uh, also, as we, uh, in, the, in our upcoming blog post about Lemma, we also tested it on different computes. Um, and uh, Basically, when we used uh, NVIDIA A100 GPU, we were able to get a much better RPC uh, than with NVIDIA A10. And uh, even though it costed, uh, the instance costed a bit more than the, the one with the less powerful GPU, uh, it compensates all in RPC. So the inference cost in the end comes equal. So for some, for, for some cases, when deploying particular models on particular platforms, uh, compute can really make a difference. But this is also doesn't, is not always the case. Uh, now, this is basically all we wanted to cover. And in conclusion, I wanted to say that as we have seen, training LLMs is, with LoRa is cheap and effective. Uh, so you don't lose in accuracy that much. Also, it costs it costs not much and it's pretty easy because this is basically uh, two lines of code uh, in having face. Uh, then there are a lot of different options of deploying your LLMs on different inference servers and uh, it, you don't need much engineering knowledge to do that. And in the end, you just get uh, very customable LLMs which you can tweak however you like. Uh, you don't have compliance issues and uh, it's just a good option for your product, in our opinion. So may the force be with your LLMs. Thank you for attention. Uh, now we would like, if you have any questions, you would like to hear them and answer. I am muted again, hello. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Thank you first for uh, a great presentation. Let's uh, dig into the questions. I think there, there are a couple of that. Uh, of those that will be interesting. 
Um, okay. Are there models you found to be especially fine tuned for WordPress plugin and team development? Uh, what, sorry, can you repeat the question? Are there models you have found to be specifically fine tuned for WordPress plugin and theme development? You can see the question written down uh, on the screen uh, where you're using the question. Um, Steve McNally. I, uh, I think you can answer the question. Yeah, could you mute, please? Okay. Yeah, yeah so. Um, I think we we're in the same room, so there is some um, some microphone to check. So, um, the short answer is no. We haven't found models fine tuned on specifically for WordPress and WordPress WordPress plugin developments. Uh, as I as I as I interpret these questions, basically like is there is a is there is a fine tuned specific mm -hmm. models which can help you to write WordPress plugin? Basically, is there like a is it in the mode of a um, GitHub Copilot, or in a mode like then LLM help you to write code. If this is a, if this is a question I interpreted correctly, so I haven't seen this, but most probably if you're going to reuse uh, Copilot from GitHub, or uh, there is a after the Llama two release, there was another release from a Facebook when they released models specifically for code generation. Uh, I think this is the closest one for WordPress. Maybe if you go to like there is a, a website called Hugging Face Hub where like all models are are like most of the models are shareable. Uh, most probably if there if you only able to find fine tune model for WordPress specifically there, the fine tune Llama two for code generation is the closest one what you are looking at. Thank you. Great. Um, next question. Um. Is it harder for companies to implement their own open source LLMs than it is to buy closed source off the shelf? Do you see that? Change? This is a great. This is a great question. Uh, so our pattern here usually we recommend move into three stages. You start, you start, uh, crawl, then you then you walk and then you run, and when you crawl and you only start on this, use use an API. It's 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 easier. It's faster if if you can do this. For example, you don't don't sell any customers, don't send any customer data, or whatever. Like you just grow. Don't 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 start from custom LLM. It's uh, you need an expertise and you need to send them out to do this. So so grow and use an you use an API. Once you once you establish your product, what you're going to build on top of this, and you build and it's not because of hype and because everyone has it, but because your product really needs this. And this is critical and important for you. Consider consider what consider like okay, how, if there is a data flywheel in my system, how I'm going to enrich the system? Like, is there any feedback? Can I build my own training data set? And once you have this, you can move to the run, to the last stage when you actually fine tune your model and make it your own model fine tunable. So, so this is usually the, the the sequence we we see. You start from 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 an API. You figure out the the, the things. You figure out can you benefit, can you not build the data, then you walk and then you run and fine tune your own model. And this is like the sequence we recommend. Usually like if you not figure out what you're going to do on top of this and you start from the building of the model, this is usually not the best idea. We have seen some people do this too, but those pretty much mature company which do already a lot of ML works and they know what they're doing. But if you just only like on a start or you haven't worked with LLMs, usually the sequence LLM, Building data and train your own, and then connect this in the loop is the, is the best approach. What okay. what what we are seeing. Great, thank you so much for uh, that answer. We actually have a question from actually two questions from John Garner, who is one of our previous speakers. I don't know if you saw his uh, session. Um, I don't know, John, which one you'd prefer me to first, but I'm going to start with the first one. So, how do you strike a balance between open source contributions and the corporate control of LLMs? And can truly open source LLMs rival the performance and scale of those produced by big tech? Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, I both both questions are, are very nice. I think I start from the second one just because it's easier. Um, so, so how we see this that. There's a clear one LLM which is the best right now. It's a GPT-4. 
right? And most probably you would not beat it. And, and honestly, you don't need to beat it because it's best in average on all tasks, LLM, you can apply LLM on top of it, right? So, and, and you're not solving all tasks at the same time, right? You, you have your own focus, you have your own strategy, and there is a very specific set of problems you are solving. Uh, so your goal is just to be better in your specific problems and in GPT-4, not on all type of problems GPT-4 can solve. So if you leave broad set of problems for uh, closed source models like a GPT-4, et cetera, and you move yourself into like a narrow set of problems, your open source model can actually beat this because a smaller, highly specialized model can always beat larger general specialized model just by the, just by the nature. Uh, in terms of the performance of like big tech versus versus uh, versus like open source, um, this is this is constantly changed, right? So Google doesn't release their models, OpenAI doesn't release their models. They give you ability to fine tune, but they not release you weights. I think like Facebook is the only one who is releasing right now. So you know they they switch in the names right now. Facebook is OpenAI, OpenAI is Oracle. And there's a lot of jokes around it. Um, so. Uh, I think this dynamic would would be would be changeable a lot, but my general sort of uh, rule of thumb is that fine tuned on your data. Uh, if you have this data wheel from your product from your customer, you always will beat closed source model from a big tech for this specific specific problem, unless they have best bigger data flow wheel. So this is like burning the second question uh, about the. About the first question, balance between open source contribution and control control over LLM. Uh, this is this is interesting. I'm sure what I 100% understand what control control of LLMs means here. Um, I think that there is a two unresolved challenges with these LLMs. Is basically everything related to privacy, security, hate speech, and etc. And yeah, open source LLM doesn't have control over this. You can do a lot of harm. Uh, Facebook, sorry, like a Google, OpenAI have some guardrails around this, which can control. So for example, Google will not return your answer. It's some of their safe filters uh, pop up. So um, yeah, basically like you build yourself, you can do whatever you want, include a lot of harms using, using industry. And then there's sort of guard, guard, guardrails uh, around this. Um, but I think this is still open, open, open-ended question. I hope I understand, interpreted, and answer question correctly. No, it definitely is thought-provoking, isn't it? Like, and there can be a prolonged panel yeah. discussion yeah. on it with so many different opinions. Thank you. Um, another question. I'm actually going to ask Luke's question. Uh, thoughts on RunPod for open source AI application and LLM hosting. This is the question. Um, so thoughts so on a RunPod. What is a what is a RunPod? I'm sure. Um, I guess it's uh, it's a sort of, sort of a product. If uh, you're not familiar, probably. Um... Runbot. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not familiar. Maybe you can clarify a question and, and, and know what you mean by a runbot. Give a little bit of a reference to your question, and maybe uh, Kiro can ask it. I can answer uh, after the event. All right, uh, John's next next question. Then, um, will the high cost? associated with training core LLMs, will open source alternatives be able to compete without significant? Yeah, this is a, this is a very good question. Uh, so uh, apart from fine tuning for a small specific problem with the LoRa, so I would put it like this, if you build on top of already existing foundational model, you can align with, you can, you can move forward with a smaller budget. With the LoRa, there is a lot of like a, uh, like a cost efficiency LLM arise, and uh, and uh, inference and training costs are would not be such such high. But you still build on top of right now. Everyone going to build on top of Llama two because this is the best foundational model open source. You can fine tune it for uh, ten twenty dollars, whatever depends on your problem and your data set. But this is not not the not the end of the world. So um, this is when you build on top of this. Uh, you don't need significant funding. Uh, if you're speaking about that you want, you are in a business on foundational model, you want to create Llama 3 or whatever, like other, like big, your own LLM for specific needs, or you are such an advanced company that actually needs this and the open source is not enough for you, 
in this case, yeah, you 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 would get like a couple of hundreds of millions bills for your infrastructure, and there is no guarantee that you would get the infrastructure right now. Even like right now, get a cluster of couple of dozens H hundred, which is the latest GPU for Nvidia, is almost impossible if you don't have any commitment with the cloud providers or Nvidia itself. Uh, so yeah, you need you need significant amount of funding and you need significant infrastructure partnership if you build foundational models. But honestly, there is only few companies who give them significant like a foundational model, such as OpenAI, Facebook, Stability, etc. Et if you if you're not at the level of foundational model, but you build in uh, but you build in the applications on top of LLMs, most probably you will be you will be fine and you don't need uh, don't need uh, significant funding for your training. Uh, but there is always risk that someone will overcome you. But there is always a risk like this. So, right, it kind of feels like we can have a follow up session next week with you and John Garner, just while kind of bouncing off of each other, because uh, he keeps kind of asking really, really great questions, and you give very insightful answers. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so uh, I'm gonna have to thank you for. Uh, a great presentation and like a really great Q and A session, uh, and uh, I hope to uh, kind of hear a lot more about uh, the fascinating research that uh, you're all doing and like the really great work that, uh, that we're already seeing. Thanks for joining us, and uh, thank, thank you for being part of the session. Thank you. John, we will uh, arrange the follow-up session <laughs> with, with you and Kiru and Maria, and um, I will see you all uh, in a couple of minutes in the last session of the day. Bye-bye.